This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Podcast, episode number 13. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. In today's episode, I interview Kevin Feenstra from FeenstraOutdoors.com. Kevin covers Great Lakes steelhead fishing in the Muskegon River, gives us some single-handed spay line resources, talks about using shorter skagit heads in colder water, and why he doesn't fish for summer steelhead anymore. Kevin also talks about how to find fish in higher water conditions and gives us the Halloween leech and the aquatic nuisance, along with some other great Michigan flies. So, without further ado, here's Kevin Feenstra. How's it going, Kevin? Hey, it's going great, Dave. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, no, I appreciate you coming on here. I have a bunch of questions from, actually just got one yesterday, which I'll, I'll uh, ask you a little bit later. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of people out there in your area fishing and uh, a lot of people new to it and getting started. So it'd be cool to dig into some of that. And I, I heard uh, heard your name for, well, I guess I've heard your name a number of places. I mean, you've got a a long history there being one of the first people to really get into the whole spay casting and spay revolution, however you want to, you know, describe it. So yeah, this is great. You ready to get started here? I am ready whenever you are. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Good deal. So I always start off just getting into a little bit of the history of, of my guests. So maybe you can give us a little background on how you got into fly fishing and eventually steelhead fishing and ultimately into your guiding service, which is kind of leading the way out there. Sure. Uh, I'd be happy to do that. I, uh, I grew up in West Michigan, a little town called Granville. Uh, Granville has become a much bigger town since I lived there. And I grew up fishing a small Creek called Buck Creek. And when I was about 12 years old, my dad's great uncle died and left him all his fly fishing gear and my dad uh though he loved to take me fishing had no use for fly fishing so um so i kind of inherited the fly fishing gear and i read every book that i could and took up fly fishing um eventually started fly tying the small creek that i love to fish uh had some environmental problems they basically spilled some chemicals into Mm. it so so i uh when i was in my the early teens or 15, 16, I started looking for other places to fish and eventually found the Muskegon, which is now my home river. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I graduated from college, uh, a local outfitter, the Great Lakes Fly Fishing Company, uh, approached me and said, you know, you ought to guide for a year uh, before you go to grad school just to tell people that you did it. And <laughs> And uh, 10 years later, uh, here I am. Or 20 years later, here yeah. I am. <laughs> cool. Cool. And, uh, I mean, what were you in, in uh, the grad school? What were you going into in school? Um, my undergraduate was pre-law, so I was going to go to law school. Oh, yeah. wow. Wow, that's yeah. quite a quite a change. So, you, I mean, it, I, I always talk about, you know, everybody that does, that gets into steelhead, we all, you know, how addictive and all that stuff it is. So, sure. I mean, it must have hit you pretty good, the whole, the, the tug is the drug. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I always, even as a little kid, I fished a tremendous amount, and I don't think it was really that big of a s- surprise to anybody that I diverged, just that I waited that long to do it. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah, no, totally, that's cool. Uh, so when you think about, uh, I mean, I guess when I think about swinging flies for steelhead, and I think about kind of your area over there in Michigan, you, your name comes up on top of the list. Maybe you can describe how it all came to be, and did you? You know, were you fishing before the the spay um, lines and all that for steelhead, and just how you got to where you are? Uh, well, kind of a big coincidence. You know, I kind of told you how I um, started uh, fly fishing, and as a little kid, uh, I didn't really know anybody else that fly fished, so I read everything I possibly could. And at the time, the only steelhead books around were uh, West Coast steelhead books, mm-hmm. so. Um, so swinging flies was just, I just assumed that was how everybody else did it. Hmm. And I caught the first few fish, you know, uh, swung flies for a couple of years when I was probably 16 or 17. Um, I got into nymphing eventually, just everybody at that age loves to catch lots of fish. Yeah. And, um, when I was or in my early twenties, came back to swinging flies, um, found some kind of unique things that work in this region 
by accident, and the next thing you know, it became my obsession, and uh, here I am making a full time living at it. So, huh, that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, so you jumped right in. Yeah, I guess the West Coast thing it slowly worked its way over there, and you were one of the first, pretty much in in your area, or is that kind of the just the Great Lakes area? Were there other people that you heard of uh, the swinging flies then? You know, I think in my immediate region, I was one of one of the first. Um, I don't know if I was the first, but uh, um, I know that in other parts of the Midwest, there were some really good guys pursuing it. Um, Rick Kustich, for one. Mm-hmm. Um, Dave Pinchkowski was oh, another yeah. one in Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and then we had some other local guys that were starting to pick it up at the same time, like a guy like Jeff, Jeff Hubbard uh, would certainly be one that I would think of as well. Mm-hmm. So. Nice. Yeah, I love, it's been fun doing these shows. You know, I'm still early on in this, but the more people I talk to, I'm just starting to connect all the dots and, you know, like Pinch Pinch Skowski and and some of these names I've already, you know, heard of and hopefully I'll have them on the show eventually as well. Yeah. And um, you mentioned the Muskegon River and other rivers, I think of the Manistee, the Pierre Marquette. Can you describe, you mentioned that the Muskegon was your home river. Can you describe how you guys catch steelhead on the uh, on the muskegon and pete humphreys was on uh on, on a, another episode and he described you know the whole boat fishing process is that uh, pretty much how you guys do it uh, as well sure uh, the muskegon as a whole is a is a good wade fishery and a great boat fishery um uh historically i've done a lot of walk and wade fishing on the river but um these days a lot of times when i want to just go out for a couple hours especially when it's this cold out it's a lot easier to run the boat, and the gu- for guiding purposes, it's just a lot safer. Um, um, the Muskegon is kind of a unique river. Um, it's 230 miles long, and we have 47 miles of Steelhead River um, um, be- below the last dam. And it's pretty much good, that entire 47 miles to the fall and winter. Um, one of the other things that's really unique about the river is that it, it, large parts of it never freeze. So... When all the other rivers in the region are unfishable, or Hmm. most of them anyways, you can come to the Muskegon and you can have a reasonable chance at catching a steelhead uh, through any time in the fall and winter. So um, I kind of came to swinging flies, the Muskegon, kind of by accident. At the time, I was fishing the Rogue River, a smaller river, uh, to the south quite a bit, and uh, I was in the summer months, we get uh, summer run steelhead and mm-hmm. I was fishing, uh, I was fishing a sculpin pattern for the smallmouth that were in the river at the time. And I kept catching, uh, summer run steelhead. So that fall I brought that to the Muskegon and thought, you know, if it works in the rogue river for summer runs, maybe it works in the Muskegon for, for fall fish. And sure enough, it worked amazingly mm-hmm. well. And um, I was really shocked how well it worked. And, you know, 15 years ago, almost every client that you take was uh, kind of indoctrinated to nymph in this area. So when yeah. I tied on a big sculpin and a sink tip, they would definitely um, raise their eyebrows and <laughs> look at me like I was crazy. So yeah, I remember uh, one, one particular guy I took, uh, uh, he had done it for about an hour, swing the fly, just kind of humoring me, and he turned his back and you know, the fly was dangling in the water and the, the rod really literally jumped out of his hand onto the back deck of the boat Jeez! Uh, when a fish took it. And after that, he held the rod really, really <laughs> tight. And, uh, That's awesome. Um, the uh, kind of reputation of the t- type of fishing we were doing grew and um, took us to where we're at now. So Yeah, yeah, that is the... The big difference with, uh, well, one of the differences in swinging that you get those, well, the tug again, you know, that powerful tug a lot of times, and it's a little bit different than nipping. I know out here I've done a lot of nipping as well, and yeah, you got to be on it. Sometimes they're really subtle, and well, I mean, they are too with, with the swing, but you guys, do you yeah. see with um, a lot of your hits are pretty uh, pretty ferocious? Yeah, especially with the fall fish, um, you know, uh, in the winter, as long as the water's above say 35 it's uh, usually a pretty hard bite so mm-hmm. hard hard to mistake the bite on the swung fly so yeah yeah that's cool do you have um i was just talking to somebody yesterday was and i, I didn't have a really great answer for this but 
as far as the rods you use, I know the, the longer rods on the boats are, are, are good, but if you're on the bank, um, is there a, a setup you might use for more of a single hand spade type of setup? Or do you, you know, what, what would you recommend for somebody <clears throat> that maybe has a single handed rod and wants to swing flies uh, for winter fish? Sure, I'd be happy to do that because that's probably um, one of the more overlooked things. Just as a preface, you know, when I first started doing this with clients, spay rods weren't popular and I didn't know a thing about them. So a lot of the early guiding I did with this was all single hand. A um, couple of really uh, good ways to go about it. If you're going to fish a big river like the Muskegon, um, you know, you could buy the typical teeny type line and fish that. But it's going to be difficult to cast from the shore. Probably an easier way is to get, uh, you know, a single hand rod, but use something with a belly and add some T14 to the end. Um, typically the bigger rivers like the Muskegon require maybe eight to 10 feet of T14. Um, you'll always be fighting the same thing you will on any river and that you'll need to back cast. And there's a lot of times trees back there. So um, kind of learning some single hand spay cast would probably be a really useful thing mm-hmm. if you're going to do that. But um, can be very successful with it. Honestly, some of the single hand lines fish just as well as the two handed lines. So, uh, you know, over short range, especially. So, okay. And these are lines that are a little bit that are set up for spay fish or spay casting on, on a single handed rod. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I think these days you could easily purchase one of those single-handed spay lines uh, and add some T14 to them and be pretty successful. Mm-hmm. You know, bear in mind that, the you know, we're in the Midwest here, our water temperatures for a lot of our steelhead season are below 40 degrees, so you're never going to get away from using a sink tip or heavily weighted fly, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's the thing, and I guess that's why people a lot of times go with a little bit longer rod and um, maybe yep. a little bit bigger. When you uh, just thinking of, as far as again on uh, with casting, do you have a? I'm not sure if you do a lot of casting instruction, but uh, do you have a, a tip or two as far as somebody out there that's new to spay casting that that helps them get going? Sure. I mean, you, you've you've interviewed Peter, and he's the great caster and he's a great angler as well yeah um my advice i'm i guess i'm more the pure angling type of the thing i uh my biggest advice to anybody who's picking up spade casting you know especially in the midwest here is not to be intimidated by the casting and to keep your cast relatively short because Mm -hmm. honestly the vast majority of the fish that you catch can easily be caught in short as long as you're willing to put yourself on top of them so and when yeah. you're fishing below 40 degrees, a lot of the times, you know, you're going to have to have at least some line control, and those shorter casts are going to be uh, much easier to manipulate than a long one. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's a great that's a great tip. I think people definitely they a lot of times, yeah, you you overlook water too if you're out there. Just you feel like you have to cast a you know a mile across, but really those fish a lot of times right right out in front of you. It's, it's a yep. good point. Yep, use your feet to put yourself over the fish or use the boat to put yourself over the fish and um, don't worry so much about the distance. That'll take care of itself. So, Yeah, nice. What is, uh, we mentioned a few rivers here on the Manistee River. I know, I guess that's a bigger river as well. And um, can you talk about, you know, do you fish that the same way as the Muskegon? And then on rivers like the Pierre Marquette, how would you typically sure. fish that? Yeah, I don't, you know, my, my experience on the Manistee would be very similar. Um, there's some really excellent guides on the Manistee. Uh, John Ray would be a good choice mm-hmm. for that. But um, but the Manistee is similar to the Muskegon, maybe two-thirds the width and maybe a little little deeper on average than the Muskegon. Um, but very similar, you know, it's a tailwater fishery, and uh, um, you could certainly use the same kind of gear. Um, the Pier Marquette's a little bit different. Uh, you know, the Muskegon, you might fish a 13-foot rod. The Banistee, you might fish a 13-foot rod. But the, the Pier Marquette and the White and the Rogue, some of the smaller rivers, uh, are more appropriate for some of the modern um, uh, uh, switch rods that are out on the market. So, mm-hmm. um, But even in those smaller rivers, you're still going to have to use a pretty dense sink tip. It's pretty common to use, you know, 5 to, five to 10 feet of T14 to get the job done. So Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So you like it sounds like T14 is the the uh the, the weight that you like to use typically and uh, did yeah. You, yeah. 
T, uh, well, T14 is probably the, you know, the easiest, j just because it's a standard and I, I've been using it for so long, it's easy for me to understand exactly what's going on below the surface when yeah. I'm using it. Um, and for guiding purposes, that's important. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also certain times a year, like right now I use T17 and even T20 sometimes. Mm -hmm. I don't use it in the same way. You know, if I use T14, I'd use a pretty long section of T14, but with uh, the sh a lot of times I'll use a short section of um, the T17 and the T20 and, and use it compressed. And um, sounds kind of funny, but the reason I do that is because this time of the year it's really cold, and a lot of times I'm just fishing the head so that I don't have to um, strip any line into the guides All because right. I keep ice, ice off the guides. Hmm. and if you do hook a fish with that really thick skagit line, it's going to get caught in the guides if there's oh, a lot yeah. of ice. So, wow. so that's why I fish mainly the head, and that's why those really compressed compressed lines work well in that situation. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that makes sense. We, we talked a little bit about uh, swinging uh, and nymphing. Is there... I know you've done both. Do you still do some nymphing, or would you recommend? Is that sure. St yeah. Um, yeah, we do do some nymph fishing, especially in the spring when the water's high. Um, you know, when the water's high, dirty, and cold, that's pretty much the um, three most difficult things for swinging. So mm -hmm. once you get to that, um, and by March, we have kind of our big spring run meeting our fall run. So the cost benefit to swinging versus nymphing gets outweighed quite a bit. I mean, you could probably catch quite a few fish uh, nymphing and struggle to hook one or two a day swinging. So, mm -hmm. um, so it, it kind of goes to that, uh, that with clients, obviously, um, especially when you're fishing in areas where everybody else is fishing, it's hard to um, talk them into swinging when they're seeing every other boat catching, you know, fish after fish after yeah. fish or, or so. Yeah. Um, but of course there are clients that know the game and will hire you specifically to swing. And we, that's the kind of client we take a lot of times. So, yeah, no, that, that makes sense. I, it is kind of an uh, interesting thing cause, uh, you know, it's the same way here. It's, you know, you know, you can go out there and catch, you know, have a good day and catch a bunch of fish and then, you know, nymphing, but maybe swinging, you're only going to get that shot at a, you know, a fish or two. Um, but I don't know. It's interesting. I think the, the numbers game is one of those, it's kind of a men mentality thing, you know, I think yeah. we should kind of, <laughs> and I've been a little bad at this as well, but it, you know, it seems like you go out there and you hook into a nice fish or two, you should feel pretty good about your, you know, absolutely. Yeah. So I, absolutely. I, yeah. So I've been, I don't know, I guess that's just kind of the way as you get into it more, you start to realize it's not about the numbers. It's more about just the experience. So, yeah. And, and, and then guiding, it's the same way on a larger scale you know i mean i uh, with our clients you know when when i'm guiding i try really hard to sell them on the um how great it is to catch a steelhead and um, yeah you get into real trouble when you start selling numbers of fish and you know one year we have a lot of fish and then the next year yeah you know they're migratory fish and they may or may not be here so that's right yeah, and then people are are mad because they don't get their <laughs> all their <laughs> fish but yeah no, it's, I was just thinking, um, we were talking about Pete Humphreys. I, I just looked up the episode for Pete is, um, episode seven. So if, if okay. somebody wanted to, yeah, that'll be there. And actually I'll, I'll provide a link in the show notes for this episode that we're doing here, which is episode, uh, 13. Yeah. So if people just go to wetflyswing.com and search for episode 13, they'll find, uh, this one here. Um, okay. yeah, so that'll be a good yeah. way. To, what's that? Oh, I was just going to give a little plug for Peter because he's awesome and he's one of my best friends and, um, you know, uh, he's probably pretty entertaining in the interview and he's very, very good at what he does. So, uh, yeah. if you want, want a little information about casting in this region, that would be the good resource for you. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. I, I, I never, I didn't know Pete as well, but I listened to him on, uh, on Anchored and after I listened to him describe spay casting, I instantly, I think I sent him a message that <laughs> during the episode, I was like, Pete, I was like, Pete, you got to come on to my show and describe what you did there. And, and he did the same thing. I mean, he pretty much broke down and all the tips. Yeah. And I, I mean, even this morning I sent a message out to a good friend of mine. I said, Hey, you got to listen to episode seven because Pete provides a bunch of tips, you know, the white mouse and, yeah. and all that other stuff. So. Sure. Yeah. And if you can ever talk Peter into taking you out fishing, he's, one of the most enjoyable people to fish with as well. So cool. anyways, 
cool. That's my Peter plug. So. Good stuff. No, that's <laughs> awesome. Now yeah, it's good. We, we can plug, uh, definitely plug some stuff here today. Um, so I was just thinking, uh, you know, thinking about uh, a memorable steelhead. I know you've, you've got into a lot of steelhead over the years. Is there one experience or, you know, whether you were a client that got into that sticks out to you? Uh, you know, I can think of, you know, just this year, um, you know, our steelhead are, have been running really much larger than normal this year, but our numbers have been really low. Mm-hmm. Um, and I take people, you know, the swung fly dry, draws people from all over the place and even, even in the Great Lakes region here. And I take a group from England that I've been taking for years and years and years. And usually um, they, they book one of the prime weeks in early December. And it's pretty common for us to get between 15 and 20 fish in a week swinging, which that, that's just the prime week. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, this year was much bigger struggle. Our numbers were low in November and, um, towards the middle of the week, we'd only caught one or two fish and, uh, you know, he finally hooked a fish and it was, it was really exceptional, you know, for Great Lakes waters. Hmm. We typically don't run as big as some places out West, so uh, you know, he fought this fish and we knew it was pretty big, but when I got it in the net, it was a 19 pound Jeez. fish. And, wow. And, um, yeah. yeah. And it just, it just made the, uh, made the week and made the year. So, that's cool. um, it's kind of one of the things about swinging flies. You, you know, you might not get as many, but when you do get one, it's probably going to be something special. And that one was really special, but, yeah. um, there's been a lot of those over the years. So that's, that's a that's a huge fish. Yeah, if you're into the into the te- upper teens, that's definitely a nice fish. What uh, do you remember? What fly it, it took? Uh, you know, it took Grazzle Dazzle. It was uh, it was a Halloween leech, which is black and copper. Oh, cool. Uh, something something pretty common at that time of the year. So, uh-huh. yeah, yep. you, you guys fish a lot of uh, a lot of big uh, dark stuff. Uh, well, black is always a good base, no matter where you fish steelhead in mm-hmm. this region, but. Uh, yeah, um, you know, in the fall, my thing is using a lot of flash, um, and it varies depending on the season. But as we get into winter, I use a lot of natural bait uh, type patterns, and uh, it's kind of a big change. But in November, when I was taking that gentleman, it was uh, you know big and gaudy and flashy, and that's what did it. So yeah, yeah, for sure. And for you mentioned earlier a little bit about summer steelhead. Do you, you fished a little bit for summers? Uh, you know, over the years I have, and I catch them occasionally, um, to be honest with you, um, they're not my favorite fish just because when they come into our rivers, the rivers that they come into are typically quite warm. So it's not really an ideal scenario. They're terrific fish, amazing fighting fish, but in warm water, a lot of times they'll just fight themselves to death. Oh, so, yeah. So it's not my, not my cup of tea, but I certainly don't, uh, mm-hmm. don't fault anybody for fishing for those awesome things so yeah for um, sure yep for sure yeah um thinking more about well i guess we're talking about the uh the flies a little bit do you have uh, a few patterns that i'm not sure if you tie a lot of your own stuff or whatever but uh, a few of your real popular flies you like to fish or you've done well on sure uh i do tie all my flies all year for guiding um pretty much tie flies every night Mm -hmm. um you know, there's a few patterns that I rely on really heavily. Um, generally, if we have big fish in the river, I use big, flashy, sculpin-type stuff in the fall. Um, then I'll start using the black and copper leeches, like that Halloween leech. Mm-hmm. Um, when the water gets a little colder, I'll switch to blue and silver, uh, again with a black base. Um, by winter time, it's a little different game. By some, the steelhead that are in here kind of acclimate to the river. One thing about the Muskegon and a lot of Midwest rivers is that it's they're very rich with food. Um, so I'll switch to bait fish patterns, typically sculpins or shiners or darters, <laughs> and, and, and invasive goby patterns as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, those make up my winter. I fish them slowly. And, um, you know, once spring gets here, you, the water temperature rises and you switch back to the flashier stuff. So mm-hmm. that's kind of how a year goes. So. <laughs> Nice. And, and are, do you have any, if I was going to provide a link in the, in the show notes to, is there, you said the Halloween, uh, fly, are there some names that, that people could find out there? Uh, Halloween leech, a grapefruit leech. Yeah. Okay. Uh, aquatic nuisance. Nice. That's a good yep. one. <laughs> yep. <laughs> exactly. Cool. cool. Uh, 
Uh, we talked about a, a couple tips on casting. Do you have something, a tip that's more of a general steelhead uh, that would help somebody get into a, a, their you know, first steelhead? First steelhead, um, you know, my biggest advice to anybody is, especially if you come from the background of nymphing, is just to get away from the habit of being meticulous and start covering a little water a little more quickly. Uh, my other big tip would be to not overlook the pocket water, the obscure water, because mm-hmm. with a swung fly, you can you can put a fly through a lot of places that you just can't put a fly with a, a nymph or a bottom type rig. So, yeah, yeah, the the obscure water. I was uh, talking to uh, Rob Rice in episode ten. He's up on the uh, up on the Skeena, and that was a point that he made was that. Uh, especially during the right water conditions, the higher water, these fish are going to be off in the margins, almost in the almost in the side channel sure. water where the salmon are. Yep. And, and yeah, he was saying that those are just key places. So that's a that's a great tip for sure. Yeah, uh, you, you know, and when when it comes to high water, just be aware that you know a lot of the, especially in, on our Midwest rivers, which are typically pretty brushy along the edges. You know, as soon as the water goes high, a lot of that brush is in the water, and that's where mm-hmm. a lot of the fish will be. So. Hmm. Uh, don't overlook the changes in the river and expect the fish to be exactly where you left them if the water comes up. So, yeah, there again, it, the more you talk, it's great because it's just reinforcing the, uh, the stuff we've heard, you know, from other, you know, some of the other awesome guests, you know, what I'm thinking back was, uh, uh, Trey Combs who just, uh, okay. think, yeah, on, on episode, yeah. episode six. And he mentioned that was his, one of his biggest things was like, find one run and just know it so well that you know every individual pebble and boulder in that run at all levels you know and that's just a great tip because we do tend especially with a boat you typically you're like all right i'm gonna cover all this water and at the end of the day you look around and you didn't cover one run that well you know so sure yeah yeah and that's the other end of the spectrum too um i learned a lot from trey combs by reading his stuff you know Mm -hmm. when i was in my 20s and um to some degree i probably owe him a little bit for that sort of thing so it's um, good to hear that you're interviewing people like that as well. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. Trey, Trey, Trey was a good one. And, uh, well, since we're on that line, as far as, uh, mentors and people that do you have a, you know, a, a mentor or two that, that helped you? I mean, you've noted a number of people along the way. Any, any other names you want to throw out there? Uh, you know, for the swung fly, there really wasn't too many people to learn from, you know, in the area because of what we discussed, but, uh, you know, there was one really good, great uh, local angler that took me under his wing a little bit when I was younger, Bob Brendel, um, works for a local fly shop, and he certainly helped me to look at, to learn to look at things differently, you know, which which helped a lot in the mm-hmm. long run in my career, so. Mm-hmm. Nice. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what I was just thinking, what year did you start, to, just so we can have a reference, as far as uh, when you first got into steelhead fishing? Um. <clears throat> well, steelhead fishing in general, probably you're talking, uh, you know, early, late 80s or early 90s. Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. Okay, yep. cool. So, yep. And and you said mostly now you do a lot of boat fishing just because for guiding it's easier, but do you, do you still get out and do some, you know, hike in and that sort of thing? Sure, yeah, especially at this time of the year when I do have free time and I might just want to go out for two or three hours a day. Um it's a, uh, it's just a cool way to spend a day. I do a lot of hobby photography too. Mm, so nice. It, uh, it kind of, the two kind of go together. Cool. Um, you, is the hobby photography, is that something you, you post on Instagram or other areas or just kind of, is that separate? Um, yeah, I use Instagram. Um, I have a smug mug site. I like doing, uh, photo essays for magazines whenever they ask me to. So, oh, nice. uh, yeah, I've recently done, uh, Eastern fly fishing a couple couple for that magazine so which is an excellent production mm-hmm. do you have a uh, on instagram where they uh, we could take a look at some of this stuff or you want to share sure just my handle kevin feenstra i would love to have a few more followers even though oh, i'm yeah. not really big, a big social media guy but uh hey yeah you know. Yeah, it's, got, it's a fun thing. So. Oh, yeah. No, you got to, that's the thing. You got to start somewhere. It, it's tough, anyways, these days. I mean, you, there's so many social medias, you know. I mean, you got the, kind of the sure. big ones, but yeah, you kind of have yeah. to focus. Uh, yeah. what, what do you think as far as, you know, we're t- talking about all this stuff and you're, you started early and you've had a, a long career now and guiding people? Is there a, 
a turning point that got you into where you're at as far as, I mean, I just think of some other past guests we've had where it seems like there's been certain things that have happened, whether they got fired from their, you know, their guiding position or whatever. Is there anything that rings a bell that was kind of big for you? You know, there's a couple of things, uh, kind of funny things in hindsight that make me think this is what I was kind of meant to do. Mm-hmm. Um, this might seem like a kind of strange one, but when I was 14 year old, years old, um, I got cut from the baseball team, which hmm. was, I played several sports. And uh, uh, as soon as I got cut from the baseball team, I started fishing every day. And huh. after, at that point, I fished every day until I was, you know, uh, a teenager. And um, all, even all through college, I fished an awful lot. So sure. uh, it was kind of a strange thing, but it, uh, it yep. in, a, in a strange fashion, it helped me get where I am right now. So, yeah. Um, Yep. Uh, that makes sense. You know, yep. from a career standpoint, you know, I started as the typical trout bum. You know, I was guiding 20 or 30 days a year and fishing 270 days a year. Wow. And uh, then uh, the balance has turned now so that at some point I became pretty serious about the business part of this. And um, but, but now I'm guiding, you know, 200 days a year and fishing 50 or 75. So. <laughs> So the balance has turned, and uh, mm-hmm. but That's I cool. still kind of look at fishing the same way. And um, like I mentioned to you, I'll probably go fishing today when we're done. So. Yeah, no, that's cool. And so on baseball, what uh, what position were you playing back in the day? You know, I was a catcher. Oh, cool. um, it was kind of a strange thing. I was actually um, practicing with the older varsity team, and then um, I came when the varsity team was done with me. I came back to the JV team and. They'd replace me with somebody else, yep. so I was I was pretty good at baseball. I mean, I was as serious about baseball as sure. I am about fishing. So, I uh, I was pretty well hurt by it. You yeah. know, devastated as a kid, I <laughs> came out of nowhere, and um, you know, fishing was my refuge at the time. And yeah, um, you know, That's... I became I I'm somebody that when I get into something, I don't get into very many things. So I am pretty hardcore about it when i do it pretty serious about it so when Mm. i shifted from baseball to fishing it was um you know a pretty serious thing for me to Mm -hmm. fish every day yeah no that's that is a good lesson i i I have a couple young kids and i think that's a great lesson i like to remind them of that you know in life and you got you know that was early uh, early thing especially for a young kid uh, having a hit like that but um yeah i mean that stuff's going to happen in life right those those things that are going to be you know, terrible and going to seem like the end of the world. But the, the point is you got to realize, you know, that's, that's just life and you got to move on and build and, and learn from it. Yep. So, yeah, and something good can come from it. And that's, that's mm-hmm. where I am right now. You know, I love what I do and wouldn't, wouldn't have it any totally. other way. And which, which is really cool. Cause if you think about it, you know, whatever the, the numbers are, you know, a fraction of a percent, make it to the major leagues or whatever. So you probably, <laughs> you know, you, not that you waste the time. Sure. I was, I was into baseball as well. I, I and basketball and, you know, uh-huh. I, I probably wasn't going to make it to the NBA regardless of how much I practiced, but, uh, <laughs> sure, yeah. so fishing was good. And yeah. you mentioned, uh, on fly tying that you tie quite a bit. What, what uh, do you have? A, I have a little bit of a fly tying challenge that I have out there on, on Instagram, um, that, you know, it's, uh, just fly tying challenge 30 and it's pretty cool. It's a lot of people that are just getting into, and it's like a 30 day challenge where they, basically get a new tip every single day if you sign up for it and okay. I, I always love adding or just seeing if there's a new tip do you have uh, you know with fly tying it's not easy to to think of one but do you have a tip for somebody that maybe is tying flies uh, either new or, or been doing it a while well I, you know as a as a guide i mean what's happened over time so um so i'm a full-time guide now i'm 44 years old mm-hmm. and i also have a four-year-old son and two one-year-old twin girls. Wow. So, so my <laughs> advice to anybody <laughs> is that uh, what I've done just from a matter of time is I've stripped the flies down to their basic functionality and components. Mm. So if you're getting into fly tying, don't feel like you need to tie complicated flies to be successful. Yeah, uh, There's pretty basic things that will work for just about any fish. And as long as you understand those basics, uh, you can do a lot of things and mm. have a lot of fun fly tying and not get uh, too bogged down with time doing it. Nice. So. Yeah, that is that is a good. I was thinking of the legs on, on some of these trout flies. You know, you, you wonder if that's a good 
kind of a mm-hmm. example like do you need to put little intricate legs on it that you know it probably <laughs> it probably helps but i don't know if it's that big of a deal sure yeah yeah i mean in my fishery probably not but uh you know yeah. i mean certainly i mean the one of the beautiful things about fishing in general and fly fishing uh in specific is that there's a lot of different facets and it can appeal to the kind of bull and china shop type people like me or it can uh <laughs> you know apply to the uh um, very meticulous personalities that want mm-hmm. to be very meticulous about the fly tying or rod building or, you know, all the other different things that you can do. So fly fishing is good for just about everyone as long as they, you know, yeah, put the time into it. So yeah, no, that's cool. You know, mm-hmm. uh, so I yeah, cast uh, cast well, don't cast far. That's my try to yep. make your line straight and at the right angle. You know, according to the current and. Mm-hmm. And listen, listen to your guide every once in a while. It's not a bad thing either. So yeah, definitely. Do you guys typically <laughs> when you're when you're swinging flies, uh, is it pretty standard as far as you know how far out and across you're casting? Or I mean, sure. are you guys hooking fish right in? I guess it depends on the run, but right in near it, the boat. Um, it's very possible to catch them near the boat. You know, generally, I try to tell people they need to cast at least close to head length to be able to have a shot at a fish, you know, Mm, mm -hmm. which is pretty easy to ask. I mean, most people can roll the head out and, uh, um, anything past that is, you know, and it doesn't hurt to fish another, uh, you know, 20 to 40 feet past that. It's when you go further than that, that you start running into other problems, you know? So, Mm -hmm. um, you have to be thinking about what that sink tip's doing once it's out there. And, um, you know, if you're using some kind of, modern fly line it might actually be pulling your fly off the bottom if you're going long distance so um you know in cold water you have to think about things a little bit differently and be a little more concerned about keeping the fly down than keeping it a long ways out Mm -hmm. so okay yeah and and as far as lines uh do you have a specific uh brand i mean i know there's a few big companies out there that you like to use and types types of lines You know, for the vast majority of what I do, I use SA lines. You know, uh, they're a Michigan company here. Um, mm-hmm. I use, uh, you know, their uh, their freight line or Skagit line is pretty common. Um, I'd consider that to be one of the more staples in this area. Okay. Um, very good line, the intermediate line for the fall, you know, and early winter. And then as we head into winter, the floating version works really well. So it just gives you a little more line control over the speed. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. And you, by SA, you're talking about scientific anglers? Oh, scientific anglers, yep. Yep, perfect. Just yep. for those that are that are new to it, that's good. I, you know, again, it, this is uh, this is good to chat here because I was thinking of um, Jim Teeny I had on in uh, episode okay. five, and he really did a good job of going back to the beginning you know, uh-huh. when, when he was getting into some of his early sure. lines and talking about that, it was really fun to hear that because, you know, scientific anglers. I mean, they've they've been there since the beginning, and yep. uh, and they're still out there going strong, which is great to hear. Yep, uh, and Jim Teeny, of course, one of the class acts in our uh, profession. So um, mm-hmm. good to hear from him. So yeah, yeah, that was that was a fun one. What do you think? Uh, you know, I know there's a lot of, you mentioned a local fly shop that, that help you along and you got some other one. Do you know any other resources that you would recommend for somebody that that's not um, either a local fly shop or guide? It sounds like, I don't know if there's a, you know, sometimes there's local websites that people can go to forums and things like that. Do you know <coughs> anything like that? Well, you know, there's some forums that are kind of universal. Um, you know, historically the Spay Pages has gotten quite a bit of traffic. Oh, sure. Um, You know, there's other things that you have to watch in this area that are very, very important. You know, probably one of the more, you know, one of the more, if you're coming to Michigan and you want to fish, look at that USGS site for whatever river you're looking at, because that'll tell you what the water temperature is, what the, what the depth is, if it's safe to wade, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah. so I mean, those, use those resources that tell you about the actual rivers. Okay. Um, for spay fishing, you know, you mentioned, you know, I would personally, I would look at some of the guide websites, you know, there's a lot of fly patterns that are out there. The guides in this state are really good about sharing information on their Mm -hmm. websites. There's not, they're not trying to be secretive. And, um, so you can go on, you know, uh, 
um, like Jeff Hubbard's website, Outfitters North. He's always got great fly patterns. Okay. Uh, you can go onto Hawkins website and they have good fly patterns as well. So, um, there's a lot of good information there just as kind of secondary information flowing from guides. So, okay. uh, I would use that. Good. Good. And you mentioned guides. I, I definitely received some uh, feedback from new guides or new people that are out there that want to get into guiding and the whole industry. Do you have uh, any tips for, for them that would uh, help them get going? Um, yeah, I would have some tips. I mean, uh, understand that you're probably not going to get rich guiding. If mm-hmm. you're going to guide, do it because you love the game. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, look after the resource um, don't get caught in the numbers game, which is kind of the pitfall. If you want to become a fly fishing guide, um, you know, getting wrestling into that numbers game is kind of the kiss of death in my opinion. So, yeah. um, and, uh, just, uh, have a positive attitude and, uh, you know, love your resource and, mm-hmm. and, uh, try to do what you can as an advocate for it. For so. sure. That's, that's, yeah, that's an awesome, awesome way to put it for sure. It's if, you know, especially, you know, you mentioned the runs were down a little bit there this year out, out West, we're having some, some declines and that's just part of, you know, lots of, uh, you know, a number of things, impacts from human activities and stuff, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, we got a lot of work to do to, to keep this thing going strong. Sure. So, good, good point. We, we mentioned, uh, again, the, the kind of the Pierre Marquette and maybe some of the smaller rivers. Can you describe how, uh, maybe some of the other rivers, a, a smaller type river, how you fish it, and do you typically sure. sw- swing more or nymph more? So if you come to the state of Michigan, um, you will come to basically two different types of rivers. You'll come to big tailwater type rivers like the Muskegon, uh, or you'll come to smaller you know, rivers that are, they're not really small, but they're maybe a third the size of the Muskegon, maybe you know, 75 feet to 50 feet wide. Um, the, uh, the, they're freestone streams, so they're they're naturally flowing. A lot of them, um, you know, both r- types of river systems work really well with nymphing. You'll find that the larger river systems, because of their heavy flows, it's a little bit more medieval how you're going to have to approach them. Um, you know, you might have to bounce the bottom or whatever. But uh, you know, if you go to a smaller stream like the Pure Marquette or the White. A lot of it's uh, indicator fishing, and you can think of it as almost a jumbo-sized trout fishing sort of deal. Mm-hmm. If you know how to indicator fish for trout on a western stream, you'd do just fine mm-hmm. indicator fishing any of these smaller rivers. And um, you just pick the river apart, you know, those smaller streams, just like you would a big one. Um, the old adage, foam is home, you know, look for a bubble line. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's it's universal. That's where the fish will be. And in the winter months, they'll be in a little slower water. In the fall months, they'll be closer to the current. And uh, have fun. Enjoy the beauty mm-hmm. of those rivers. So Yeah, and, and probably are those rivers you can still find some places hiking in, getting away from some of the traffic and things like that? You can. Um, some of the rivers, you know, are, are definitely more popular than others, especially the famous sections. Um, the Pier Marquette has some famous sections that get a lot of foot traffic as well as boat traffic, mm-hmm. but it also has quiet water. And if you're willing to walk and look at a topo map and stuff, you probably could find some pretty good fishing. Um, mm-hmm. and there's other rivers that are more obscure, you know, that just don't get the fishing pressure because of their location. So, um, you know, you can, you can find out about those pretty easily and just, uh, hoof it and you'll typically find fish just about everywhere. So, okay. Okay, and and with those smaller rivers, if you were to, we talked a little bit about the the single handed uh, line. Is there a specific line you would recommend? Maybe a, a SA line that uh, would be good for a, a single handed spay type of. Uh, so, I mean, you mentioned the the T fourteen. Yep. I imagine are you still using T fourteen there? T fourteen, yeah. You can use uh, any of those spay light lines. Should they make them in light enough don- denominations to work with an eight weight? rod oh, okay um you could certainly use a typical kind of you know big head floating line uh and and add the t14 on to the end of it so sure. maybe mpx line or a titan taper or something like that okay um, could also work so okay yeah perfect perfect and do you get out to any i we were talking a little bit about the the salmon river up in new york and i mean are there what are the other big when you think of i mean i guess you spend most of your time fishing kind of your your area but are there other areas you get out to 
Um, you know, historically, I fished. Uh, I have fished out east a bit. Uh, I, I I do some public speaking in Ohio, and so that draws me to their rivers. Oh, okay. Every now and then. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I fished the Cataraugus uh, before. Uh, I fished it with um, Rick Custich's brother, Jerry Custich. Mm. Um, yeah, but the, some of the Ohio rivers are wonderful, the Chagrin and, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's a variety of them, Chagrin, Conneaut Creek, the Grand, the Rocky, um, really mm-hmm. beautiful rivers. Probably you wouldn't think of beautiful rivers in, you know, fairly urban areas, but they really are beautiful. Um, they're more susceptible to runoff than our rivers are, which they get huge runs of fish, but, That's uh, right. it's just difficult to time it. So. Mm-hmm. Um, there's kind of key people, you know, in, in Ohio, you might want to talk to, a a Jeff Liskey or Jerry Darkus, um, mm-hmm. really, really good resources. Jeff is, that's right. yeah, Jeff is probably one of the best, just pure fishermen I've ever met. So cool. Um, and, uh, he has a kind of long history of, um, spin and fly fishing. So he could, yep. he could be really interesting as well. So, yeah, good deal. Yeah. I've talked to both of them and I, we're hopefully going to. Okay. Yeah, set something up down the down the line with them. That's that's always the the question is how how many uh, the more I get into this, you know, how many people are out there that can help you know answer some of these questions and yeah, there <laughs> there there's a lot of great resources. It's pretty cool. Yeah, hopefully I'm not dropping too many names. I'm just no. enthusiastic about no a lot is, of these guys. So yeah, this is great. This is this is pretty much what I what I love because you know now they're out there and these people who's you know if you're listening to this you can go do your own research i'll provide some you know like i mentioned some show note uh, show notes uh, links uh things like that but yeah I, i've dropped a few names too of uh, past episodes i i've already had so yeah this is this is a good deal so when you get going you know single hand or, or two handed rod i mean you you pretty much passed up the the single handed rod uh well 20 years ago right um, probably not that long ago, I was using two-handed rods um, on and off when I was, you know, even 15, 20 years ago. Uh, but the technology in the lines was a lot different then, and it yeah. wasn't wasn't as practical, you know. That's right. I mean, you're talking pretty industrial, heavy-duty fishing on this river that I'm on, and the old-style lines that we had just were not suited, you know, for what we're doing now. So. Along came these intermediate lines um, at some mm-hmm. point. Initially, they were European lines that really sprung things going here, you know, the uh, the guideline lines especially. And then uh, th- then the American companies started making some really, really good stuff. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, here we are now with just great technology that makes swinging flies in any conditions pretty easy. So mm-hmm. um, the change in technology is really what boosted Fly fishing in this area made it a lot more practical as far as the spay yeah. uh, game goes. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it made it a lot easier. Did you, when you started spay casting, what was the, I mean, eventually did you get, get to a point where you're, uh, you know, I'm not sure if you would say how, how fast you got to the expert level or whatever, but how, <laughs> you know, how, how did you get there? Because I, I know, you know, definitely people struggle with, with spay casting. Did you, um, did, were you guided by other people or how'd you do that? Uh, you know, it was a slow process over time. Um, you know, I was lucky once when I was probably 10, 12 years ago to fish with Simon, you know. Oh, wow. And, cool. uh, you know, he I just took him out on the boat, and, and there was things that I learned just watching him. You know, now there's just so much good information. You could go to one of these spay claves for a day and learn yeah. every cast. Um, that didn't exist at the time. You know, you'd buy a video and if you're looking at a video and you have never seen anybody spay cast before, it's pretty hard mm-hmm. to, to, at least for, for somebody, you know, for me, it was hard to kind of look at a video and say, what in the world is this guy doing? You know, and then you see it in person and it's pretty obvious what, what they're doing. So, um, mm-hmm. when it comes to spay casting, anything that you can do in person, you know, and just go out with somebody that, um, they don't have to be a professional, but just somebody that has some experience cause it'll, cut your learning curve by a long, long ways. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think you can do a lot in, you know, videos and even this show, this is audio We're we're talking a lot about tips at audio, but yeah, there's no, you can't replace getting out on the water with, you know, whether it's a guide or just an instructor. Yep. Um, exactly. And, yeah. Pete, uh, you know, on that episode we mentioned, he did provide a bunch of like really great tips that I think will help 
people get going. But um, yep. on this on the spade claves, you guys have. Uh, I know there's a bunch all around the country. Do you guys have any near your area? Yeah, we do. Every fall, we have a really good one on the Muskegon. Um, probably ten minutes from where I'm talking to you from. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, it's at Henning Park, and it's usually the last weekend of September. Uh, they call it Spay Fest, and it's been mm. going for quite a long time, and we've had some really good people there over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, it's put on by one of the fly shops, the Great Lakes Fly Fishing Company. Um, so it's And there's typically a lot of vendors there, so it's, it's a good event. And uh, if you're in Michigan or the Midwest, you know, within some hours' drive, you might want to look into coming in late September because you can learn a lot about spay casting in a very short period. Um, the people there are very nice about sharing information Hmm. and, uh, it's just a great way. And then those types of events happen all over the Midwest and all over the West. So, Mm -hmm. and all up into Canada. So there's places, places to go to learn. You just have to do a little research and go for it. So for sure. Yeah. And I'm sure down the one place I, haven't really hit on as much as like kind of some of the California stuff. I mean, uh, that's kind of the, the tragedy really of, of kind of some of the steelhead runs is the further you go down South, at least South on the West coast, the, uh, you know, the lower the runs get, um, just because of impacts. But I hope to, I hope to connect with some, some more Californian, uh, type of, uh, you know, interviews as well. But, uh, yeah, good, good. Uh, I'll, I'll make a note on that one as well. And in the show notes for the, for the spay clave. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, Kevin, we're just about there. I, before we wrap up, uh, you know, I occasionally love to ask, you mentioned the, the story about one of the big fish and, you know, 19 pounder is crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. That's a pretty much, I think the biggest fish I ever caught was probably, probably in that range and yeah, it blows you away. But do you have a, uh, a crazy fishing story? Anything that rings a bell? Like if you've guided some people, you, you know, over the years, anything that sticks out to you? Uh, well, <laughs> right. I've had, yeah, this is a, the, the kids might ones, be, <laughs> go, yeah, uh, go. uh, you know, I'll tell you one that's not related so much to swinging flies, but, um, I took a guy and a lady out fishing, nymph fishing, and, uh, we were using pretty heavy gear at the time. The water was high and, uh, we were fishing for steelhead and, uh, I just rigged the lady up and I was rigging the guy up and I showed her how to cast and she threw it out there and got snagged. And I said, well, mm-hmm. you know, um, just, just hang on a second. I'll help you out as soon as I get your husband finished. And the next thing I know, I looked up and that sinker was coming out of the water about 150 miles an hour. Jeez. Uh, it hit me right in the forehead. I fell oh. over and the boat was unconscious for a couple <laughs> minutes. So, wow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, later, Later, that person approached me at a fishing show and said, you know, <laughs> you probably don't remember me. And I was like, oh, no. I remember you. So <laughs> really? Wow. Right right in the forehead. That's, the, right, that's yeah, intense. Yeah, knocked me over. I was, they were slapping my cheeks and, you know. The wow. What, what, was the, what was the last thing you remember before, it, uh, before you went uh, unconscious? Uh, you know, just watching that sinker come flying out of the water and hit me totally. right now. Yeah. yeah, and I, I fished. I guided the rest of the day. I had a huge welt on my forehead. looked like a softball. Wow. Uh, yeah. So that anyways. is cool. That is cool. Is that picture online anywhere? People could take it. Uh, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I do have it though. So. All right. Good. Good. All right. Um, what, what do you have going on? Anything in the next six months or so as far as, I mean, it sounds like you're going to be guiding a lot, but any, anything else you want to, you want to note, uh, you know, something um, new? You know, I do a lot of public speaking at this time of the year, uh, various oh, cool. Trout, Trout Unlimited clubs and um, around mid, around the Midwest, you know, I've been in, uh, Indiana last week and, um, I'll be doing some other ones over by Detroit this week. So, um, and down to Indiana again this weekend. So, um, generally speaking, um, just j- big fly shows and, um, talking to fishing clubs in the region. So look mm-hmm. me up if you're, if you're in the area, it's listed on my website where, where I'll, where we'll be and. And not just me, but some of the other guides that work for us as well. So okay, cool. love to see you. So yep, yeah, that'd be great. And uh, yeah, before I let you go here, did uh, we miss anything? I mean, we covered a bunch of topics. And um, anything you want to add before we get out of here? Um, nope. Just uh, you know, go out and enjoy these resources and try to try to keep them like they are. Don't let them get any worse. Try to either move them forward or keep them as good as they are right now. So. Um, want to 
want our kids to be able to do what we're doing. So yeah, for sure, for sure, that's a good good way to put it. Uh, so you mentioned as far as people, the the best place would be, uh, I guess Fiends. Feenstraoutdoors.com, that, that's one place just uh, they can get to you, sure. but also on social media. Uh, Instagram, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of arcane in my social media, just Instagram. So Okay, perfect. No, that's, I think okay. that's pretty much one of, the, one of the hottest ones anyways right now. Good, good stuff, Kevin. Well, I appreciate you coming on to chat about this. Uh, you know, I, I think there's for sure at least a couple people I'm going to contact today and, and answer a few questions because, I, you know, we answered those today. And I, I appreciate you coming on and taking some time to do that. You bet. Thank you. All right, good. Well, we'll look forward to uh, hearing more from you. And maybe uh, eventually when I can get out to the Midwest, I'll, I'll give you a ring and, and uh, catch up with you. All right. Sounds great. Thank you so much for having me, Dave. Okay. Thanks a lot. See ya. Yep. Bye-bye. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links that we covered in this show, just go to wetflyswing.com and search for episode 13. If you like the tips in this episode, you can just go to wetflyswing.com slash free and get the Steelhead Tips PDF Quick Guide, which includes a summary of all the great tips that we've had up to this point in the series. If you have a second, I would love if you could take a moment and leave a review on iTunes. This helps get the show out to more people and helps some of those people get into their first steelhead. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I look forward to catching up with you soon and hopefully seeing you on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.